and it's a real pleasure and it's an honor indeed and I appreciate very much the hospitality in your beautiful country when I left Holland it was freezing <laughs> when I left in Bangalore it was pretty warm <laughs> but I tell you my heat shock protein is doing well I am not <laughs> So what I want to do is to talk a little bit about what made me enthusiastic about science, a bit about my career, but of course also about discoveries that we made and put it a little bit in perspective. I'm a chemist, so for those people that are not chemists, there will be no exam afterwards, don't worry. But yes, I will talk about chemistry but I try to put it in perspective. So, let me go back in time a little bit to the Wright brothers. You all recognize this film here. Slightly over a hundred years ago, they were flying for the first time. And I get sometimes the question, why do you need molecular motors or molecular machines? The Wright brothers got a similar question. Why need man to fly? If God wanted us to fly, he would have given us wings. <laughs> Nobody would have realized that a hundred years later, we would build a Boeing 747 on an Airbus. Although we admire the flying bird, a Boeing on an Airbus is not a bird. All the three and a half million components are artificial, made by chemistry, material scientists, engineers, etc. to build an airplane. And the flying principle, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> is not the flying of a bird. It can carry 400 people at 1,000 kilometers an hour across the ocean, 10,000 miles. Try to do that with a bird, you will fail. So, it does its job perfectly. And so, although we admire Mother Nature, we scientists can far beyond, go far beyond Mother Nature to make the drugs, the materials, the planes, all the machines that we use in daily life. But we should also be very modest. Because a hundred years after the Wright brother, we cannot build a bird. I know there are fantastic biologists here. I challenge you, you cannot build a single cell of this bird. Not even one of the machineries. So we have to learn a lot, and there's a long way to go. So we should never forget, although we all are eager to make something that helps society and to build a product that maybe our industry can use, the basis is fundamental science. And don't forget to invest in the basis, in fundamental science, because our universities should focus, of course, also on the basis, the fundamental science. And so we should not forget that to go from, to go to your smartphone, it started many years ago, in the 40s and 50s of the last century, when physics and chemistry built the transistors, built the liquid crystals for the displays, the engineers, the computer scientists, they all teamed up. Nobody had an idea in the 50s that we would build a smartphone. The computer did not even exist. The world did not exist. It took 50 years, and as far as I know, we have smartphones now since 12 years. And my students cannot believe that there was a world without smartphones. <laughs> Maybe the same for the students here. Yes, there was. 12 years ago, we didn't have that. And nobody had an idea that we would get it. 50 years of fundamental science and engineering, etc., changed completely our world of communication the way we live today. So, the important thing, of course, is how to go from, excuse me, from fundamental scientific questions to new insights and discoveries that will change our lives. And, of course, we follow a path to the future. And we go for this big question mark. A challenging scientific question. Challenges for our students, dreams for the people, opportunities for society and industry. But more than often in science, we get lost in this beautiful garden 
which is called the Garden of Science and Education and Learning. And we come on question marks, we hit on question marks that we have never thought about. And these are often the most beautiful ones, because they lead to unexpected discoveries towards our future. I grew up on a farm in a very tiny village in the northeastern part of the country. In my village, hardly anybody ever visited the university. And thanks to a government scholarship, I could go to the university. But these are my parents. And I was, as a small boy, interested in discovery and learning and to know. And I asked my father, how is it possible that this is red, that this is white, these flowers? How is it possible that from a tiny seed you can grow the wheat? So, in a farm you have a lot of adventures and discoveries and you can learn a lot. But it was thanks to my teachers in school, in high school, he was my chemistry teacher. He was marvelous. He inspired me a lot. And although I was very good in mathematics, he convinced me to study chemistry because I loved experiments. The beautiful colors, the crystals, the smells, the fact that you can make new materials and molecules. Then I came to Groningen University with Professor Winberg. He was American and he challenged me even more. And this was my, one of my first molecules. You see here, this typical molecule with the double bond in the middle. This was in 90, when I was a student. And I forgot completely this molecule until I started my own career. And you will see it back in a moment. So I want to give credit here to our teachers that open windows to the future of the students, to our young talents. They shape our future. And this is what you do at this university here in this city. So I started after my PhD to work for a company for six and a half years, Shell Company, a major international company, both in the research labs in Amsterdam and then in the Bioscience Center in the UK. But after six and a half years I decided to go back to university to become a lecturer and then to build my own research. And so I am a chemist, I build molecules in the laboratory, chemical synthesis, and we build molecules because we want to test a new theory, because we like the beauty of the molecule or we want to make a new drug, a new catalyst or a new material. There are many reasons to do this. But let me emphasize once again, this year is a special year. You celebrate 75 years of your Institute of Pharmaceutical Science. We all celebrate 150 years of Mendeleev. The UNESCO has declared this the year of the periodic table. And this gentleman, I think, taught us the relation between the atoms. And I would argue we all like Newton and Einstein, but I think Mendeleev should easily rank among these gentlemen. Why? Because he taught us the relation between all the atoms and molecules in the entire universe, in our own body, everything around us. And so now we know that the molecular formula of the human is this. Hydrogen 375 million, this is new, eh? 375 million, oxygen 132, but there is also manganese, fluor, chromium, one cobalt. I couldn't even get all the elements here on this sheet. So now you know. Of course there is a lot of hydrogen and oxygen because be composed of water. That's also strange, eh? That a human is 60% or so water. But there are also a lot of metals, etc. So, due to Mendeleev, we have a universal language. The language of the elements, the language of the molecules. And we share that as scientists. When I go to Japan, to China, to South Africa, to America, as a scientist, we have a common language, and we value that. Our language is the language of molecules and atoms. That's typically chemistry. And of course, there is a lot of talk these days about borders. Scientists don't have borders. We go beyond borders. That is our duty, to go beyond frontiers, into the future, to train our students for the next decades ahead. 
international cooperation and a passion for discovery. I think that is what we share together, colleagues, institutes, and with our students. So we, I'm a chemist, and we make molecules, small molecules, two carbons, and four hydrogens. Ethylene, the basis for plastic, 160 million tons a year. Of very complex molecules. I think a really important compound, vitamin B12, you will appreciate that in the pharmaceutical institute, a very complex molecule, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphor, cobalt. This was once called the Mount Everest of synthetic chemistry. I'm closer to the Mount Everest now, so it's fair to say that. This was made by Woodward and Ashimosa many years ago. It was a real big accomplishment. We need only tiny amounts, microgram quantities to stay healthy. So the whole world production, as far as I know, is only 35 tons a year. Simple and complex, large scale, huge scale, petrochemical, or a drug, which is crucial for life. So we can make the drugs and the dyes, the cables and the cars, all the components of the smartphone. This is typically what chemistry does, not in isolation, but together with our friends in pharmaceutical science, in engineering, in physics, in material science, in biology, all together we can make this. But what we are not very good at is make something that moves. We can build plastics, we can build drugs. But look at your body. There are these fantastic machines, the rotary motor in your cell membrane, the bio-nanomotors that transport things through your cells, the ribosome, a fantastic robot that makes the, all the proteins in your, or most of the proteins in your body. Look at this flagella motor. Isn't it wonderful that makes the bacteria swimming in your guts? Look at the most beautiful process, the optical splitting in your eye. The fact that I can see, you can see me. This is where we started, this is where I started my journey. But of course, we should also not forget that in our body, these are soft materials, it's a bit of a different world. A robot or a motor or a machine in your body is not a robot in the Tata car manufacturing plant. Look, this is hard and this is soft. This is two meters, this is 24 nanometers, almost a billion times smaller. So you have to deal with the effect of length scales. Now, we go back to Richard Feynman in 1959 who taught us there is plenty of room at the bottom. And what did we learn from it? The first computer that was built filled half this room and could do way less than your smartphone. And top down, the devices became smaller and smaller and now we have a nanometer scale dimensions. But what happens in life, in living systems? We build bottom up. Molecules, small molecules, bigger molecules. And this is what nanoscience does. Building from small to larger, bottom up. And I had the privilege, 50 years later, after Feynman, that we developed these nanomachines and that we got a call from Stockholm. Let me start. At my early career, I had to write a grant, like many young stars that begin, begin at the universities. And there was, there was money available to make materials, new materials. And I thought, let me write a grant to do information storage at the molecular scale with light, not with the electricity, like in a normal device, but use optical storage. Now, what is the most beautiful switch? I mentioned already, that's in your eye. In your eye is a retinal molecule, we all know that. It switches from a band form to a linear form with light, and then it can switch back. And of course, there are millions and millions of these molecules in your eye that make it possible that I can see you and you can see me. A crucial aspect is that it switches forward, which is an extremely fast process, but it should also switch backward, eh? because otherwise it's not a good switch. Otherwise I could see you only once and then it would be over. Now, people ask me, why didn't you use, when I wrote this grant and we started this research to do optical information storage and optical computing, why don't you use the retinal from your eye? 
But of course, you have to realize this was optimized in modern nature for the process of fishing, not to build a computer or a data storing system. And of course, they are not very stable outside the biological system. And so, we built artificial ones that you can switch between two states with light. And you see here a carbon carbon double bond in the middle. That's the similar as in the retinol in your eye. And these are very robust. You can switch back and forth, back and forth many times. And then you can make optical devices. You can write information in a piece of plastic. Lately, we have made a real electronic device. So each of these items that you see here is a monolayer of molecules. So molecular transistor type function. Now, what can you do with it? In the early days, when we were able to write information in zeros and ones with light, we could make indeed a piece of the plastic and we could write information. And then when you calculate, what you could do is to write on a compact disc these kind of megabytes. That's to say, your grandparents and your grandchildren for six or seven generations need only one compact disc to play constantly music without changing. That is the promise of nanotechnology. But of course it's not true. Because how to write zeros and ones when they are at a molecular scale next to each other? Nobody knows how to do that. Or you will say, yes of course we can write single molecules. But then you have a single molecule here in the room, in this auditorium, and one outside of the campus at the nano scale. But when they are next to each other, with light, you hit a lot of molecules. So we still have to solve this problem, and I'm eager to learn from a very brilliant student here how to do that, because after 30 years, I still have not the solution. So please help me, you can come afterwards to me, to give me the, the idea how to do it. But when you can make a switch, you can do a lot more than computing and information storage or making smart materials. So what we did is, for instance, we took a protein channel from our gut from the bacteria. So this is a mechanosensitive channel from the coli bacteria. It's a protein complex. And the beauty is, you see it here, sticks through the membrane. This is a top view. It's a pentamer of a protein. It is normally tightly closed, but it can open to a three to four nanometer pore. And we thought, wouldn't it be cool to build in a light switch and to open close, open close with light. Why has the bacteria this? This is a kind of a safety valve. When the pressure builds up, the osmotic pressure in the bacteria, and the bacteria prevents itself from dying, it opens this valve, material flows out. So what we did is, we engineered five switches in this material. So we modified the genome, built in light switches in the protein, you see here five of these switches. I don't want to go into the details. And with these five switches, we could open and close this nanopore with light. Just switching on a lamp. And then we put it in the membrane of a vesicle, which you can consider as an artificial cell, a capsule. And then you switch on the lamp, and this is what happens. The pore opens and material flows out. So I know there is a keen interest in drug delivery here. You can make tiny capsules, build in these protein nanopores, load them with the drug, irradiate the light on the spot, and they open and the material flows out. Control drug delivery and self-healing materials. That's the kind of uh, things we are working on. And then we thought, okay, if this is true, if this works, can you build a switch into a drug? Make a pharmaceutical that you can switch on and off. Look, if you have an infection here and you take an antibiotic, normally the antibiotic goes everywhere and it also hurts the bacteria, eh? the good bacteria in your body. What we want is that you switch it on only on the spot where you have your infection. High precision in therapeutic action. Is that possible? This is a bit of an unconventional approach to precision therapeutics in the future. 
And of course, we focused on two important problems, bacterial resistance, which was called by the World Health Organization, one of humanity's ticking time bombs, and cancer treatment. And we all know the problems with chemotherapy, eh? You get all these nasty side effects. So does it work? What we did is we took, for instance, Cyclo, which is a widely used broad spectrum antibiotic. We built in a light switch, and you see here a nitrogen, nitrogen double bond. You can switch with light between two states, the trans and the cis form. It changes the shape, and we switch from off to on. So now we have an antibiotic that we can switch off and on. And the beauty is that this state, and chemists know this, the cis state is less stable, it switches back automatically, and we can precisely tune it. After five minutes, after one hour, after 24 hours, after 48 hours, just by synthetic design. And so the idea is that you have an infection, you irradiate, on the spot, you activate it, and after 48 hours it leaves the body, and it's off, and you don't build up antibiotic resistance. We are not at that stage yet. We work now for the first time with animals. We hope to get to the clinic in the future. But, for instance, you can see, we can grow bacteria now in patterns. Just look at mask. This you appreciate. This is a yin-yang figure grown on bacteria simply by using masks that means fading with light. We can go to, to precision chemotherapy. So we took, for instance, bortezomib, which is used in the clinic for some forms of cancer treatment, and we built in switches, and now we can switch on and off proteasome inhibition. And of course, these are all the first stages. My dream is that with this high precision high precision imaging techniques, because I work a lot with the medical people now on PET imaging and on fluorescent imaging and on MRI, that you do this high precision imaging and then you see these tiny tumors, you feed them with such a drug and you then read more or less the information and you write the activity of your anti-tumor drug to treat the small tumors. That's a bit of a dream. We are far from that yet. But we all know how long it takes to develop something that can be used in the clinic. There was one major problem that we had to solve. And that is how to get light in the body. Because you don't want to use ultraviolet light or something that is dangerous. And that might... So the important thing is to be in the optical window here. 600 to 900 nanometer. And you all know when you have a red laser, you can go straight through your finger. You can go into the body, deep penetration. And so recently we succeeded for the first time in making an antibiotic that you can switch with red light. And that is a really important step for us because now we can make the step from simple cells towards the next step, eh? animal studies, etc., maybe to the clinic. So, to summarize this first part of my talk, we started with making switches Looking at Mother Nature, looking at your eye, we built smart materials, information like drug delivery and smart pharmaceuticals. Will we have DNA nanotechnology? I'm not working on that, but I know many people work on that. You read about it every day. Genome, genome editing, Casper Chris, all these techniques. Network complexity. How are we going to deal with that? To tackle this complexity? Or as I mentioned, smart imaging and photopharmacology. Or maybe in the future, rewiring the brain. What will happen if we know a lot more about the functioning of our brain? Will we get a chip implanted that helps us when we get older to walk better or to memorize better? There are also some ethical problems associated with this. Eh? You all know this about gene editing, DNA technology. I think at our university we should also not talk only about science, but also discuss these kind of ethical problems and go into the dialogue with our society, what it means for the future of our society that we do all these inventions and discoveries that make our future possible. Let me move on to molecular models. And so we all know 
than taking with a human being or an animal or a plant that are motors, because otherwise I could not speak, I could not move my arm, I could not walk. Perhaps you forgot but this is the movement in a molecule around the carbon-carbon single bond. This is an extremely fast motion. It was measured even in the solid state in crystals that it moves with a frequency well over 100 megahertz. Can you imagine? But this is not a machine or a motor. It's just thermal motion of molecules or inside molecules. And we all take care of that when we design a drug, for instance, we look at protein conformation, etc. But look, this is the motor in your body. The ATPase synthase motor. If you think the motor in your car is beautiful, I agree. Motor cars are beautiful motors. But my favorite motor is this one, and I think this is way more beautiful than the motor in your car. This is the ATPase motor in your body. It's a few nanometers in size, it rotates. And do you know, I learned from my friends in biology that this motor generates half your body weight of fuel, ATP, every 24 hours. Can you imagine? You are 80 kilograms and it produces 40 kilograms of fuel in your body every 24 hours. Now, I enjoy now Indian food, but I don't eat 40 kilograms every 24 hours. Nobody does it. Because most of the ATP and the components are recycled by all these tiny machineries. And sometimes I get the question, a motor, what it's good for? Look at your body. There are millions of these motors. They make the energy, the fuels in your body every day, now, at this moment. Well, this is a wonderful machine. So what were the fundamental questions we were challenging? The fundamental question were, of course, how to control rotary motion and how to control directionality, left or right. Because, again, think of your car. If there's equal probability going backward and forward, you stand still, eh? You don't move with your car. So either clockwise or counterclockwise. How did we solve that problem at the nanoscale? We again looked at Mother Nature, at virality, left or right. And the most beautiful example is the right and the helix of DNA, the genetic, where all the genetic code is. It was called by Nature, the journal Nature, the Mona Lisa of modern science. And I think we can agree with that. How do you distinguish between left and right? You make molecules chiral, and this is crucial in pharmaceutical science to make drugs with one-handedness, eh? left-handed or right-handed. How did I learn it? I grew up on a farm, and in Holland we have these wooden shoes when you are a kid. And I tell you, as a small boy, I think we all make a mistake sometimes with left and right, eh? it's always difficult. But when you once, as a small kid, step with your right foot in the left wooden shoe, it hurts so much that for the rest of your life, you know what left and right means. <laughs> you never forget. So we made synthetically molecules that were either right-handed or left-handed. And then we can irradiate with light and we can make a propeller, a motor that spins continuously in one direction. You see here a carbon-carbon double bond, you see a propeller moving and it moves in four steps. One, two, three, four steps. You see the four different colors. Now, now my friends from chemistry will ask, how is it possible that you can rotate around a carbon-carbon double bond? Because every first year student learns that you cannot rotate around a carbon-carbon double bond. But of course what you do is you break the double bond when you hit it with light. And then it can rotate. This is what happens in your eye. This is why I can see you. And we did exactly the same. We started with the switches and then we made the rotary motor. And due to the carality we could spin it in one direction. 
we can spin it clockwise, we can spin it clockwise. Of course you have to put in energy, you have to fuel it, like the motor in your car, the energy comes from the light. That's how it works. And so, yes, it rotates. The photochemical step is extremely fast, picoseconds. The turbo steps are slower, so it is two photochemical steps and two turbo steps, and that make a 360 degree rotary cycle. Now you will ask, how fast was this motor when you discovered this? I have to disappoint you. It rotated only once an hour. <laughs> and uh, luckily it rotated only once an hour because if it would have been very fast, we might have completely missed it. But you cannot build a car with a motor that rotates once an hour. Not even at an hour scale. But now in the last 15 years or so we have built several motors, I think 50, 60, 70 different motors. And now we have motors that rotate once an hour, once a minute, once a second, once a microsecond. The fastest ones, 10 million rotations per second. And everything in between. So we get, this is also the power of synthetic chemistry. You can tune your molecules. Like you tune your molecules to be a better drug, we tune our molecules to be a better motor. And so, I will tell you with you a few stories about what we did with it. And first of all, a very recent story. My students looked at the moon. And you might think, are these students in Groningen so romantic that they look at the moon all the time? <laughs> no, there was another reason. We wanted to look at this synchronized motion. Because if you want to build machines, you have to synchronize motion, like in the real machine. And you know when you look to the moon, you always see the moon from the same phase, eh? You cannot look at the backside of the moon, unless you send your satellite and look at the backside. So yes, we built this tiny machine where you see it rotates under the influence of light, it's powered by light, but you see there are more than one rotation and they are synchronized, because this part sees this part always from the same side. And this was a really important discovery for us because it's a stepping stone to more complex machine type functions at the nanoscale. So we were extremely pleased with this synchronized motion. We built motors on surfaces, we built motors in display materials, I will show you. We built polymers that are responsive. We built nano cars. And I will share with you a few of these things to give you a flavor why we do this and what the future can bring us. So, first of all, my students put a nano motor into a display. You know, when you take your smartphone, there is this soft material eh, behind the glass. When you press, you feel that it is soft material. Eh? Don't press too hard, eh? because you destroy your smartphone. <laughs> So what my students did, they took their liquid crystal material, the display material, they put in nanomotors, they are tiny, they put a glass rod on top of it, it's like a boat on the sea, it swims. And then, this was one of these moments that every scientist once in his life likes to have. The student came to me, the students, and said, Professor, you have to come to the lab, we want to show you something. And when they showed it to me, I could not speak for five minutes. Because for the first time in my life, I saw something moving without touching, only by switching on the lamp. So this is what happened. So they switched on the lamp, and you saw it moving. It started rotating. You saw the whole soft material. This is soft, and this is soft material, the surface. It changes, you see, the architecture, the color changes. So now we have all kinds of soft materials that we can change the surface. Not a solid surface like this, but a surface that is responsive, that changes. And for people that are interested in stem cells and cell biology, you can imagine what you can do when you have a surface that is responsive, that changes surface tension, orientation. And we can rotate objects. And why does it rotate? Because we wind and unwind the molecules that are organized in typically in a display. 
So we change color, we change orientation, etc. We also put motors on surfaces. So here you see typically a design, two legs to keep it on the surface, or an extra stator, axle and a rotor. It took us eight, nine years to team up with our physics colleagues to make monolayers of rotors attached to surfaces. And the reason we did this, if you ever want to make a device, you want to integrate it yeah, with electronics or with surfaces. So I'm from the Netherlands, and you will appreciate that our ancestors, they built these beautiful windmills 500 years ago. We needed them because they were pumping the waters from our land. Because Holland is 40% of our country is below sea level. That's why we have these big dikes and these windmills. Maybe we'll need them again in the future when the sea level rises. So we thought, let's make nano windmills. So here they are, one billion times smaller. We put them on the surface like monolayers and they all spin under the influence of light. So, are we going to get self-cleaning windows? Solar panels that clean themselves? You don't have to wash your car anymore in the future because it cleans itself because of this responsive coatings. Many groups around the world are working now on this kind of smart materials. Not with our motors, but once you know how to make dynamic functions, responsive functions, you can make all kinds of materials that adapt, that change. And especially for instance solar panels, this is a issue, eh? Because a lot of dust gets to these solar panels and then they are not very efficient anymore. Not in Holland, because it's raining a lot, but when you are in the Sahara or in southern Spain or maybe also parts of India, there's always dust on these panels. You have to clean them every now and then. What if you clean themselves? Wouldn't it be beautiful? Recently, we built them also in crystals. And I show this on purpose and I don't want to go into details. We put, put these motors into so-called metal organic frameworks. These are three-dimensional structures. And each of these pillars here is a motor that can rotate. So we have now solid materials with millions of these motors rotating. And this was very tricky to prove it. And here I have to give credit to Professor Rama because we did solid state NMR but in particularly Raman spectroscopy and that saved us because Raman spectroscopy <laughs> made it possible thanks to Professor Raman's inventions made it possible that we could prove that in these crystalline materials all these millions of rotors rotate very nicely Raman spectroscopy is extremely powerful for these kind of problems. So thank you so much. Now, let me continue. You, some of you have seen this picture before with a nano car. So here, my students were a little bit jealous of the engineering students. Because I saw today here a car built by, I have a picture with the students. And my students also wanted to build one. They wanted to build a solar-powered car because you know these engineers students, they go to Australia, they compete with this race in the desert, 3,000 kilometers. And my students said, "Oh, okay, can we also go to Australia?" And I said, "Look, guys, we are not engineers. We are molecular engineers." <laughs> so they decided to make a molecular car. And you see, it's a four-wheel drive. Four of these wheels, they are motors, and it's two. This is two meters. This is two nanometers. One billion times smaller. And it moves on a nano road of co copper atoms in this case. It was, of course, not about a, a, a nano car. Eh? What was the fundamental scientific question? I asked this to the students. Of course, the fundamental scientific question was go from rotary motion to translational motion to make something moving over a road. That was the fundamental question. By the way, my students worked on this, it was very complex. I, I, I said to the students, if you succeed, you can go to a conference to Australia, I will pay. <laughs> but a PhD student in Holland takes four years, and this took us more than eight years, 
So the first generation students, they worked very hard, but they never made the top three. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but finally we succeeded, and we could make it open. And here is the nano car. This is the picture of the nano car, two nanometer in size. It moves over the surface. But let me emphasize, at the nano scale, ladies and gentlemen, the world is a bit different from what you see outside here on the road. Eh? It moves. When you have your arm moving, there are millions of these motors that make it possible, and there are proteins that move more or less like I show here. So this is probably how it moves. It walks over the surface. This is the nano world. This is movement in the nano world. And if you don't believe me, this is a movie I borrowed from Harvard. I hope it works. Okay, this is happening in your cells now. In your body, inside your cells. These are the roads. And inside your cell, the roads are built. When the car goes by, they are demolished, you see? And when a new car comes, a new road is let down. This is all fully dynamic. This is the nano world. You see, the highway, it's built and broken down. And then it's transported. Maybe our nano car is not so bad, eh? It looks a bit like this. This is what our friends in biology and biophysics tell us. How it really works in your cells. So this is the first electric car that was built in the world, as far as I know, 1835. We all appreciate the modern electric car, and there will be a lot of electric cars in the future if we can solve the problem of good batteries and energy storage, which is still a quite a problem. This is my nano car. Look at this white powder here. <laughs> it doesn't look so spectacular. But look, in this tiny powder, there are one billion times one billion identical nano cars. So maybe my car manufacturing plan is not so bad. Eh? <laughs> Okay, I will finish with two small stories, yes? One is about, I was asked many times, can you make a muscle? Because in biology you all know there are these beautiful muscles in our arms, in, in our body, which, which are these protein motors that make these filaments glide and then I can move my arm. This is collective motion amplified from nano to microscopic dimensions from nano, molecular, all the way to micro dimensions. That's why you can lift your arm. Is it possible? Can we do it? So we thought, let's make a motor which we can dissolve in water and then we engineer so that it forms fibers. And I don't want to go into detail, but you see some fibers here, five to six nanometer, because these mo 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 molecules are instructed to assemble, like the proteins in your body. And then we can draw a muscle. Not by this only, we just had to add some calcium, calcium chloride. And then we can draw a muscle, here it is. And I will show you how it works. Look. Oops, anything moving? Yeah, now it moves. Thank you so much. You see, you, you, I'm, I'm not a very good nanoscientist. He's much better. So you see here, moving here. This is a freestanding muscle that we make, an artificial type of muscle structure. You see, depending on the direction of the light, the light comes from this direction, it bends here, and it comes from that direction, it bends there. This is a tiny molecule that are assembled and amplify motion from the molecular scale all the way to a centimeter long artificial muscle. And it can lift a piece of paper. Of course, it's not very strong yet. But ladies and gentlemen, what you see moving here is the first supramolecular artificial muscle and it's 95% water. 95% water, what you see moving here, and only a tiny amount of material. And of course, we look now at all kinds of applications, what you could do there, for instance, in biomedical applications and so on, because they are compatible, I think, with biomaterials. 
Now my last uh, small story is this one. The Fantastic Voyage. Some of you remember this book of Asimov and this movie. That there was a there was this spaceship that was shrunk down to micro sized dimension, it was injected into a body and it went to the brain to do a repair. Science fiction. And people ask me, can you make something like that that goes into your body? So we, we took carbon nanotubes, they are very famous, carbon nanotubes are loose everywhere in physics and material science. We put some enzymes there and we built a kind of a submarine, a nano submarine. The question then was, we discussed with the students, what should be the fuel to power it? And then we thought, there is plenty of sugar, glucose in your body. Let's use sugar. Here it is, the submarine. And what you see here is, we'll see it moving. Now you will see, I don't see nanotubes here, no, because they aggregate, because there are proteins from the nanotubes, they tend to aggregate. But look, I don't touch it. This is only sugar, water, water and sugar. And you see this tiny spider moves autonomously. And the black dots, these are the bubbles of oxygen that tells you that they convert sugar and it's propelled with sugar as a fuel. Water and sugar. Of course, it's extremely primitive. Think of the Wright brothers. It's extremely primitive. But now my students try to move from here to there to make submarines moving in a certain direction, to load it maybe with a drug or so, and to move something from one spot to the other. We can make the first steps like a baby. That's where we are. So will the future bring nano science? Will it bring robots? that go through your blood vein? Is it science or science fiction? Will the surgeons inject these robots to go for a tumor, to deliver a drug? Not now, not in 10 years. But when you know how to do autonomous movement, when you can build nano systems, maybe in 50 years from now, I predict that will happen in the clinics. They will have these tiny robots, they will be injected and they go to do a repair or a precise delivery of a drug. This is the nano future. But I'm not very good in prediction because I'm a scientist, like most of us here. So I would say the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And this is what we do at the university. So let me conclude by saying we start with Mother Nature. We have the beautiful examples in nature, but we are not limited by nature. So we build switches and we build motors and we build dynamic systems. And so maybe we will have responsive materials. We have micro and nano robots. There's a lot of talk about robotics that will change our life again. Smart pharmaceuticals. These are just a few of the possibilities in the future. But of course, I could not have about anything, wasn't it, for my team of students. You will see here this fellow, this is Anibar, he is here in the audience with us. He is a PhD student from your country, working <laughs> on this. We enjoy international cooperation. I mentioned already we cooperate with our physics colleagues, with the pharmacy, with the biologists. We also cooperate with many countries and I have students from 14 different nations in my team. In so, I started as a student and I want to finish with a few small messages for the young people here. I started as a student, like many of you. And people ask me all the time, do you have something learned during your career? Do you have a message for us? And my most important message is discover your talent and follow your dreams. Everybody here is highly talented, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Please follow your talent. Be confident. Also in my studies and during my career, often things go wrong. You know that when you study, when you are a scientist, when you do experiments, things go wrong. This is normal because you learn from that. Discover your energy. 
What is your passion? What gives you a lot of energy? And also, don't take it too easy, eh? Discover your limits. How hard can you set the bar? I still remember when I had a math teacher that gave me such a difficult problem that I almost hated him. But when I solved the problem, maybe in that case with the help of a friend or so, I was so proud that I solved it. Please, look, how can, can you set the bar? What is your limit? But most of all, most important, you are all going into this adventure in the unknown, your future. Follow your dreams and you will make a fantastic future. So, if you think there's nothing to discover, please remember these words of Francis Bacon. There are ill discoverers that think there is no land when they can see nothing but sea. Reminder. I was asked this week many times, and I'm sure you might, students might ask here, did you ever realize you would get a Nobel Prize? <laughs> no. I was teaching students, I was doing research with my students in the lab, I was in some committees, and so I had to write grants, publications, etc. I was working as a scientist very hard. If you want to win a gold medal at the Olympics, these guys or these girls get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, train very hard for the next year, and then when they go to Tokyo next year, and if they are talented, and they enter the competition, and if they are lucky, and they work hard enough, they might get a gold medal. That's what we scientists do. We enjoy our passion, our job, working with the students, we work hard, that's what we do. But then, on one evening in 2011, a colleague from the United States called me and he said, you were on American television last night. I said, I, you are joking, this is a joke. No, 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 you were on American television in the Simpsons. This was a week before the Nobel Prize announcement. And look here, the Simpsons made a betting poll. Chemistry, Saar, Werner, Ferica, Sonakashira. Werner got the Nobel Prize in 2014. I had to wait another two years. <laughs> My students immediately came with this. I told the students, oh, this is wonderful. If this is the highest honor I ever can get in my scientific career, to be, to be on a primetime American television in The Simpsons, <laughs> what else do you want? <laughs> so, I got this call from Stockholm, which is of course Boy's Dream. But I want to finish. Thanks to all my students, all the people I cooperated with in the different disciplines around the world. All my friends around the world. Thanks to them. But I want to finish with one message. And this is of my hero, Leonardo da Vinci. He said 500 years ago, when nature finishes producing its own species, man begins, with the help of nature, to create an infinity of species. For the young people in the audience, please, Imagine the unimaginable. Thank you for the honor. Thank you.